Hello and welcome. My name is Raj Basord. I'm a consultant psychiatrist based in London, and I'm recording a continuing professional development podcast for the Royal College of Psychiatrists. And joining me today is Rebecca Maguire Sneakers. She's a lecturer in psychology at the Department of Psychology at Bath Spa University, and she's published a very interesting paper in the Psychiatric Bulletin entitled Hope optimism and delusion, where she goes into much greater detail than normally happens when people are discussing some of these concepts that are quite important in various aspects of psychotherapy and the psychological understanding of why people get depressed and the treatment of depression and anxiety. So let me start by asking you, Rebecca, um, the word optimism, what does it mean? Well, there are different theoretical presuppositions that underlie the construct of optimism. Some see optimism in terms of an individual difference, a personality trait or global disposition characterized by a broad tendency uh, or expectancy that outcomes are more likely to be positive than negative. So Carver and and Schreier are proponents of this perspective and developed a self-report assessment uh, called the life orientation test with items indicating pessimism or optimism on a four-point scale such as overall I expect more good things to happen to me than bad. Optimism has also been conceptualized as an explanatory style. This is rooted in the work of George Kelly in attribution theory, but it was given popular force by Martin Seligman. From this perspective, optimists are more likely to attribute positive outcomes to internal, stable and global factors and out and negative outcomes to external, unstable and specific factors. This construct of optimism is assessed by measures such as the attributional style questionnaire. Optimism has also been described as a combination of expectancy and agency. So Snyder proposes a model of optimism as an ability to conceptualize goals, to find plausible pathways to them, and to have the motivation to use those pathways, a sort of plan A, plan B, plan C approach. The HOPE scale is an assessment of this type of optimism. Underlying many of these constructs, I will find the presupposition of control and and future-mindedness. So pathways thinking in particular adopts this perspective that not only can we conceptualize different pathways to a goal, but that we have the agency, the fundamental control to achieve them. And before investing in his work on on learned optimism, Martin Seligman explored the concept of learned helplessness or which is a state of being that follows persistent and inescapable loss of control. So he demonstrated this in dogs who were persistently shocked without the opportunity to escape and did not later perceive the opportunity to escape when they were made available. Many models of optimism presuppose a future-minded orientation towards life. So Philip Zimbardo, who is perhaps best known for his work on the Stanford prison experiments, also explored, among other interesting things, the concept of time perspective and whether we tend to focus on the past, the present, or the future. These perspectives can have valences as well. So you could be past positive with lovely uh, memories or past negative with bitter ruminations, present hedonistic, self-gratifying, living in the present, present fatalistic, a sense of helplessness, Uh, in belief that forces are out of your control and future-oriented. Optimism is often conceptualized as a future-oriented or future-minded construct. So the tendency to construct a positive expectation of future outcomes or to employ constructive pathways towards a future goal. In 1990, Banfield argued that there's a difference in time perspectives among the haves and the have-nots with the haves being more future-minded and the have-nots being more present-minded. But there are other time perspectives accounted for by optimism constructs. Seligman's model of attribution is essentially a rationalization for the outcome of past events. 
Matlin and Stang revealed with the Pollyanna principle in 1978 that we tend to remember past events as more positive than they actually were. That people tend to expose themselves to more positive information and ignore negative information. That they take longer to recall unpleasant stimuli and report seeing more positive stimuli than they actually did. So optimism is generally accepted as a preferred way of being. It's been correlated with a range of positive outcomes, subjective well-being, physical health, persistent efforts, higher income, better relationships. But the problem with correlational evidence is that the inferences that are sometimes made with respect to causation. So people might infer that optimism causes subjective well-being, physical health, higher income, better relationships. But it could equally be inferred that subjective well-being, physical health, higher income and better relationships could cause optimism. Great, thank you very much indeed for that. Um, so we can see from that answer that actually it's a lot more complicated uh, when we think about optimism um, and it's useful to have a, a, a particularly if you're doing psychotherapy or psychological treatments, a more in-depth understanding of what it really means to be optimistic. Let's talk a little bit about something you hinted at there, which is this kind of positivity bias that psychologists find over and over again in the general population. Can you say something about yes. that? Well, much research in social cognition, social psychology suggests that most of us have persistent cognitive biases characterized by biases in probabilistic reasoning and attribution. So we have the optimism bias, which is the tendency to overestimate the chances of good things happening in the future and to underestimate misfortune on a variety of life events. There's the better than average effect that shows that individuals tend to consistently place themselves as above average on a variety of trait dimensions when compared with others. The problem with this, of course, is that if you're so assuming a normal distribution, there should be as many people below the average as above the average. And there are many other examples of self-enhancing cognitive biases, from the self-serving bias, the tendency to take credit for success and deny responsibility for failure, the self-centered bias, the tendency to take more credit for jointly produced outcomes, and the false consensus, the tendency to see our own behavior, thoughts, and feelings as typical. There is ample evidence to suggest that excessive optimism can lead to a host of ills. So while we might need some optimism for motivational purposes to get out of bed in the morning and, and face another day, excessive optimism might lead us to wrap our arms around temptation and ignore risks that we might otherwise better perceive. So for instance, minimize the risks of smoking or overestimate our driving ability or underestimate the risks in unprotected sex. Moreover, optimism can create the potential for unmet expectation. So when not realized, this can impact on physical and psychological well-being. So optimism has often been placed as having a central role in depression by psychological models of depression. Could you say something about that? Biases of optimism are said to apply to most people, but generally not to individuals with depression. This is termed depressive realism. So while some have found no support for the, this notion of depressive realism and suggest that people with depression tend to distort judgments in a, in a characteristically negative fashion, there is evidence that even individuals with depression can exhibit persistent biases of optimism. So a meta-analysis by Moore and, and Fresco in 2011 of 75 studies representing over 7,000 individuals indicated a small overall effect of depressive realism and also that individuals with depression and individuals without depression both showed a substantial positive bias. So what about um, the use of optimism in cognitive behavioural therapy? Well, cognitive behaviour therapy is offered on the NHS to stop negative thought cycles and this is based on the presupposition that, that there are helpful and unhelpful ways of reacting to a situation based on how you think about them. Uh, so such cognitive restructuring tools encourage individuals to challenge unhelpful thoughts that threaten self-esteem and, and therefore mental health. And there are many other examples of interventions in, in other areas designed to increase optimism, from positive self-statements and affirmations to positive future imagery, or making internal attributions for success and at 
and external attributions for failure. Now, in your paper, you offer a critique of the role of optimism in cognitive behavioural therapy. Yes. Well, my main critique is, is what is the purpose of facilitating biases of optimism in a non-clinical population where individuals are likely to have biases of optimism already? Secondly, if, if excessive optimism can lead to a catalogue of ills, how are proposed techniques conducive to mental health in a non-clinical setting, or even how helpful are such interventions even among a, a clinical setting who appear, uh, in a non-clinical setting who, to, who appear to have persistent cognitive biases of optimism. And finally, by locating the source of distress or, or of pessimism at the individual level, does it minimize social, economic and sy systemic factors that impact on mental health. So, um, what about yourself? Are you an optimist? Know Thyself was inscribed at the entrance of the oracular temple of Apollo at, at Delphi with a variety of interpretations that have since followed. Some see it as a cautionary statement regarding over-reliance on the opinion of others. But it has also been interpreted as, as a call to humility a counter to unrealistic views of oneself and perhaps an attempt to temper cognitive biases of self-enhancement. Fisk and Taylor suggest debiasing techniques um, when people make overly optimistic judgments. It's suggested that when this happens, that people should make salient the risk inherent in a given proposition by considering the exact opposite of the op optimistic outcome to highlight the potential costs of their behavior. And David Denning, in his 2006 article, Strangers to Ourself, suggests that we accept that self-knowledge is fraught with error and that we try to develop cognitive repairs to compensate for errors in optimism and probabilistic reasoning. But still, as Festinger says, we are not rational, but rather rationalizing animals. So I'm sure that despite my knowledge of these tools and because of my inherent tendency to be optimistic and to minimize the inherent risk of certain actions that from time to time I will optimistically throw caution to the, the wind only to rationalize it later. And in terms of which optimistic perspective I would most subscribe to, it would probably be the pathways approach to look towards the future with plan A, plan B and plan C because it recognizes that despite my best efforts that not everything will work. So it's always good to have a backup plan or two. Great, thank you very much indeed. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about whether you think, given you're an expert on optimism, when you, when you look around and see psychological colleagues and professional psychologists, and um, you clearly have also encountered um, psychiatrists, academic psychiatrists, and in, uh, in a way I'm asking you at an intuitive level, not a, not a strictly empirical level, what's your sense of professionals in the psychological arena? Do you think they're optimistic more optimistic about the human condition compared to the general population? Because my, my view is mixed on that. Mm -hmm. I, I actually think um, studying psychology and psychiatry, or maybe there's a bias that occurs because of the sample of individuals mm -hmm. you end up treating, that a lot of my colleagues seem, um, to me at any rate, incredibly pessimistic about the human spirit and the human condition. And I actually think that one of the things that people get most from therapy is being in contact with an individual, a therapist hopefully, who is relentlessly optimistic um, about the human predicament. But what, what, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I suppose, again, it's, it, it, it can be an individual differences in, in terms of where people place themselves uh, on the continuum of optimism and, and pessimism. And I suppose there can be a utility in, in taking a, a counter approach with a particular patient. Um, so there is a... a um, a famous um, cognitive behavioral therapist, Albert Ellis, who aims to disenchant individuals of, of um, shoulds and, and musts that they must that they they have in their lives. So um, I must be perfect at everything. Everyone must like me. Um, I must be able to do what I want when I want and and and, and have fun all of the time and and. So he might take a more challenging approach with respect to 
to that. Um, but at the other end of the spectrum, um, of course, you know, as, as I've mentioned, there the, there is a suggestion that uh, with depressive individuals that there can be persistent negative biases that uh, can can be unhelpful and, 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 and indeed it could be helpful to, to, to challenge that. So I suppose it would really be a case case by case approach, but really in in this paper, it's it's just a general call. I, I, there's there's I, I find quite an overinvestment in in the notion of of optimism, and I suppose it's it's uh, a call for temperance. Uh, um, uh, Rebecca Bagua Snikas, thank you very much indeed.